ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الايمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القراني ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الايمان دربنا درب قويم درب الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم سبعة يظلهم الله في ظله يوم لا ظل إلا ظله الإمام العادل و شاب نشا في عباده ربه ورجل قلبه في المساجد او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام الحمد لله we give praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala ni'mihi al-kathira upon his great amount of blessings and favors that he has bestowed upon us we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially for giving us the opportunity and the chance and the health and the strength to enter into the blessed month of Ramadan. And we thank him for that ability that he has given to us to observe the fast and to stand by night in the Taraweeh Salat. And by doing these things, we are actually establishing the holy month of Ramadan. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has exhorted us to establish the month of Ramadan. Besides identifying the individual virtuous acts and the individual actions and deeds that carry a tremendous amount of blessings. On some occasions, the Prophet ﷺ spoke specifically about Saum, about fasting. Man Soma Ramadan. Whosoever fast in the month of Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also spoke about performing the Qiyamul Layl, the Salat at night, the Tarawi Salat, the Tahajjud Salat, standing before Allah. And in one tradition, he also mentioned hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari Alaihi Rahma, Man qama Ramadana imana wa ihtisaba. Whosoever establishes the month of Ramadan. So in this hadith, it goes to show that the month of Ramadan ought to be established. Established with what? With all acts of worship and all acts of ibadat. The day of it should be revived and the nights of it should be revived. So besides identifying the psalm and the fast that we ought to do, and besides identifying the salat or the sadaqat, or the khayrat and the good deeds that we ought to do, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made specific mention of man qama ramadana. And man qama ramadan who stands, and it means who establishes the month of Ramadan. So therefore, if we are able to do this that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to us about, then falillahi alhamd, all praises are for Allah. Allah is the controller of our lives. Allah is the controller of our souls. Allah is the giver of energy and giver of physical health and strength and spiritual health and strength also. And if we are able to do some act of good deed, then we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And one important thing that we have seen, and in fact something that we see, that are mentioned in many different traditions when the Prophet ﷺ spoke about doing deeds and actions in the month of Ramadan. He spoke about the tremendous amount of blessings and rewards that we will get for doing these things. The Prophet ﷺ, while enumerating and highlighting the different actions that he has exhorted us to do in the blessed month of Ramadan, he has mentioned a lot and focused a lot on the blessings we will get, on the rewards that we will get, what you will get if you do this, 
and what you will get if you do that. The hadith recorded in many uh, books of uh, compilations of the hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "A good deeds, al hasanatu bi ashri amfaliha." That a good deed starts from ten of its kind, and it continues, and it continues towards sab'a mi'atin zufin towards. 700 doubled and multiplied a good deed any good deed you do any good deed you do it starts not from one blessing but it starts from 10 blessings and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying the, it depends upon your ikhlas and your sincerity and the way you perform that action in conformity to the way of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then the blessing which may fetch you 10 rewards and 10 blessings, it will go up 50, 100, 200, 700, and it does not stop there. 700 doubled and 700 multiplied, and the blessings keep on going on. The Prophet ﷺ says, Allah says, Illa sawm, except fasting. Fasting is not like that. Fasting is beyond that, subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا الصَّوْمِ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَانَا أَجْزِيُ بِهِ Because fasting is done only and only for mine sake, and I alone shall give its blessings and its rewards. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about general good deeds. It will go and start from seven, go up seven hundred and multiply. But then he quotes the hadith of Qudsi in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but not so with fasting. Fasting is far ahead of that. Fasting is beyond that. Fasting is much greater than that. That is, the blessings of one fast is much more than if you were to take 700, double it, multiply it by itself many times. Fasting is still beyond that, subhanallah. The amount of blessings, Allahu Akbar, Allah alone knows how much he will give for that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man taqarraba fihi ila Allahi bi khasla. Whosoever comes closer to Allah, tries to draw closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with any optional good deed. A deed and an action that has not been made farz obligatory or essential upon a Muslim but a person wants to do it then he will get the blessings that if he had done a farz action in another month and if he does a farz action a compulsory duty in this month then he will get the blessings as if he had done 70 of the same compulsory action in other months hadith recorded in the Sahih of Ibn Khuzayma and Imam Bay Haqi alayhimu rahmah so we see the point here that I've mentioned before is that nearly in all those things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about. In the same riwayat, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you give a person something to drink to break his fast, then, then on the day of judgment, Allah will give him such a drink, subhanallah, that after that drink he will never ever feel thirsty. And he continues and mention, he continues to mention about the great blessings and the virtues. And nearly every single good deed that we have been told about and that has been mentioned, it is always coming up. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioning the great amount of blessings and the virtues and the rewards and the status the person will have in the sight of Allah. He has mentioned this for a reason and for a purpose. So that you and I will learn to understand how valuable these things are in the sight of Allah. And when we understand how valuable these things are and how significant they are in the sight of Allah, then this itself will be an encouragement for us to go further and further into it. But a very important thing for us to understand is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has also given us a tremendous amount of information about matters pertaining to the hereafter. And when we look at the traditions that speak about the great amount of virtues and the traditions that speak about the matters that are to come in the hereafter after we die, 
a very important point we should note and this is why that is very very important for us to men to understand the significance of the blessings and the rewards that we get for the doing of good deeds because many a time when a hadith and narrations of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are narrated and mentioned that 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 has in it the amount of blessings you will get 100 blessings for this and you will get 70 blessings for this sometimes these things do not appeal to us why because for some reason or the other we have become so engrossed and caught up with the worldly pattern of life that what really has significance and meaning to us is what we can see physically with our eyes the good the prosperity the wealth if a man says you go to work and a man says if you spend this one hour extra i will double your salary and i will give you your salary three times in the days god by on a saturday you get double time on a sunday on a public holiday you get triple time so people used to aim for those days one day you can do the same work and get three times the salary these things appeal to us because they are worldly because they are tangible because they are physical so we go after it we may choose something a job that is more that is paying more that has more incentives that has more perks that gives you more and more because this is the language we seem to understand because of our, de our deep engrossment in the worldly life we are attached to these things so when somebody announces something a simple thing sale is on we rush towards it because we understand the value of that and we understand the significance of this you know and in this way we conduct our lives wherever there is something to gain and it's much more than in other times. And it is something that we can understand. That's something that connects with us. That's something we can literally see the value. And physically see it because it's there. It exists. It's tangible. We can collect it. We can put it in our pocket. We can see something moving from 100 to 200 to 300. From 1,000 to 2,000. And 10,000 to 20,000. These things have a lot of value to us. Because this is our language and this is what we actually get connected to. But when we are told that this thing, if you do now, you will get 700,000 blessings and 300,000 blessings and 70 blessings more. We really don't pay so much value. So we leave it out. We leave it out because we are, may Allah forbid, probably we don't understand the value of the blessings. We don't see the value and the significance of the rewards that are contained in the doing of that action. So we leave it out. You worship Allah more, we hear it. We hear it. The Prophet ﷺ says when you come to the masjid and you perform salat, the nafil salat with the imam. And you remain with the imam until he finishes all the salat and then go. You get the blessings of all that which the imam, the imam has done. If you read the Quran, you get so much blessings. If you give sanaqa, you get so much blessings. If you stay in the masjid until ishraq time, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to do every single day in his life, in and outside Ramadan, making the dhikr of Allah, doing the tasbih of Allah, performing salatul ishraq, Allah takes the responsibility to fulfill all all your all the matters and all your concerns for the day allah takes that upon himself we read it we hear it but we really don't physically see it we just have to believe in it so sometimes it doesn't really appeal to us that you know what i want that i want to get that i want to get that blessing i want to get the blessing that even though the day of judgment will be such a horrible day I don't want to be thirsty on that day. I don't want to be in trouble on that day. I don't want to be affected. I do not want to be affected in this way or that way. So I want to go for it. I want to, I want to get those blessings. Blessings of being kind to your parents. We hear it again and again. We hear the Quranic ayah. And sometimes some of us, we ill-treat our parents. We are not kind to our parents. We are harsh to our parents. We are disobey, disobedient to our parents. But those ayats of the Quran really doesn't appeal to us. It doesn't connect 
for some reason. You know why? Because the blessings that are mentioned there, we don't, probably we don't see it and understand it. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned to us the matters of the hereafter, perhaps true understanding and true knowing what lies ahead of us, we can put some value to the blessings that are mentioned. Because if not in this world, and we do need the blessings from Allah, we need Allah's Rahman, His mercy, we need Allah's compassion, we need Allah's kindness, we need Allah's favors and His boons in this world. We can't live without them. Every breath of our life is dependent upon the even and the permission granted by Allah. It depends upon the kindness of Allah and we cannot do without them. But even if we don't pay any value towards good deeds being connected to this, because of the fact that we may be living in a good way, everything seems to be okay, but one day, one day, our eyes will become closed to this world. And as soon as our eyes become closed to this world, our eyes will automatically become open to the next world. And all these things that are connected to rewards and blessings, we're going to see it directly, clearly with our own eyes that Allah will give us to see. Then and then, there, we will know and understand the value of saying subhanallah one time, subhanallah. There and then, we were hearing about so many good deeds we could get. We will know the value of one small good deed. Because that will be the world where there will be no wealth and no money and no family and no friends and no prestige and no honor and no fame. That will be an empty world, a world that is empty of all these things that will be connect, that we have become connected to, and it will be a world filled with blessings and sins and punishments and rewards and the joy and the happiness coming from Jannah, Allah's pleasure or Allah's wrath and anger. That will be the world of these things. So if we don't understand because of our deep engrossment, in the worldly matters, then one day we are going to, even if it means by force, we will have to understand the value of the word blessings and rewards. We would have to understand that because one day definitely each one of us will go in the grave. There isn't anywhere else to go besides the grave when we die because this world is not forever. And your life is not forever. And my life is not forever. And one day, this sweet, beautiful life will come to an end. And everything will come to an end. And all, all joys and happiness will come to an end. And there will be a time of being no more in the world. Not walking on the face of the earth. Not being remembered by anyone. We will be beneath. We will be under the earth. In a dark hole. In a dark pit. Except if Allah makes it a place that is good for us. That world will come. The world of the grave will come. The world of the barzak will come. There and then, subhanallah, really and truly, we will understand and appreciate the value of the things we used to hear about. We will understand what is a reward. Not rewards, a reward. What is the value of a blessing? And then after that, we will be resurrected. And there will be a day of judgment. Again, subhanallah, not a world, not a world of dirhams and dinars, not a world of wealth, not a world of, of money and houses and honor and fame and all these things that co were connected to this world. It will be a whole new, different world. What will be your state? What will be my state? What will be the state of people on that day? It will be dependent totally. It will be totally dependent upon the amount of good deeds we had achieved while we were on the face of the earth. A person came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyus sadaqati afdalu, O Messenger of Allah, tell me what type of sadaqah is the best? What type of sadaqah is the best? Charity. Meaning, 
when given it at what time fetches the most amount of blessing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said wa anta sadaq that you should give charity at such a time wa anta sahihun shahihun that you are sound and healthy you are good you have some money you hope that if you keep it you will become wealthy and you fear that if you give it you will become poor that's the best time to give sadaqah and charity he says, Wala tumhil. And do not wait. Hatta idha balakatil hulkum. Don't wait until when the soul starts to come out from the body and it reaches the throat and you sense the pangs and the agonies of death and you see the angel of death and you are feeling the movement of the soul and the body being ripped away from the body and you know very well you are going to die with the heavy tongue and with the eyes rolling you want to tell your family members give so much money to that masjid and give so much money in charity and give so much money to this place the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that time it will not be acceptable because anytime a man reaches marad al maut the sickness that leads to death his will and his testament is not accepted because most of the time he is not conscious of what he's saying. The Prophet ﷺ says, When taqula, that time you say, Li fulanun kadha, wa li fulanun kadha. Give so much and so much, so so and so. Give so much and so much, so so and so. Wa qad kana li fulan. The Prophet ﷺ said, It has already gone to so and so. Where are you giving it now? You are not going to get any blessings for that. There are many people who wait for this time. And although they had that desire while they were alive, that they want to give so much money in sadaqah for the sake of Allah, so it will be a means of continuous and perpetual rewards afterwards, it does not happen. Because the wait, the wait until that time, the children make them sign over while they are conscious, they are healthy and they are good. Now when they are sick, the children already lay their claim. They have their claim. What are you going to do? Sometime you entrust it in the hands of your son or daughter and say when I die, give so much to so and so. Give so much to your brother. Give so much to your mother. Give so much to the masjid. Nothing is given at all. No blessings are given. Yes, actions are judged by intentions. But in this case, when you had the power to give and you delayed until that time, that is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. So therefore we see here, that we ought to understand that the time of doing deeds that will bring about rewards, it's not the time when we are leaving the world. Not the time we are becoming blind to this world. Not the time when we are just seeing figures around us. Not a time when the tongue is becoming heavy. It's before that. It's not at that time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us about the matters of the Day of Judgment. And that's something we have to be worried about. Because in this month, nearly everything you do and everything we all do, we are hearing about so much blessings you will get. So much rewards you will get. If you do this good deed, if you speak good, if you give a good advice, you give good counsel, you make peace between people, you feed somebody, you give charity, all these are, it's always about so much rewards. What we have to remind ourselves of is that one day, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, we are really, really going to need those rewards. We will read it, need it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought to us, it is for this reason, to understand the value, the significance, and the importance, and how much we need rewards and blessings from Allah. He placed before us different sceneries of the hereafter. Sometimes he will bring before our eyes the angels questioning us in the grave, making us sit up. Sometimes he will bring before us uh, the, the heated air, the scorching heat coming from Jahannam. Sometimes he will bring before us that we are standing on the day of judgment. The open plain, naked as the hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said, each and every one of you will stand on the day of judgment. You will be barefoot, nothing in your feet. You will be naked, no clothing on your body. And you will be uncircumcised. And you will be in the same way that you were at when your mother had given birth to you. You will be exactly in that state. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, she heard that. 
Imam Bukhari mentions that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala upon hearing that, we also, if we hear something like that, in this world if somebody is naked, obviously it is not acceptable. In that world, people will be resurrected naked. The graves will burst apart. They will be walking towards the court of Allah. No clothing on the body. Uncircumcised. They wouldn't have any shoes or slippers. There wouldn't be houses. There wouldn't be hills. There will be one flat piece of land that is called the Maidan. Of Hashar, the open plain, like the plain of Arafah, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, one flat, large, massive plain, where every man will be guarded, every man and woman who was born, born from the time of Adam alaihi salam until the man, the last man who will come on the face of the earth, every single person, the first of the generations. The last of the generations, the ambiyas, the believers, the unbelievers, everybody will be open, everybody will be there. When Aisha radiallahu ta'ala heard that people will be in that state, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, would they be naked, naked without clothing, men and women? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yes, O oh, Aisha. They will be naked, men and women. They will be standing close to each other, Aisha said. Ask. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yes, O Aisha, they will be standing close to each other. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was then asked by Aisha, O Messenger of Allah, wouldn't they be looking at each other then? In that state? The Prophet of Allah said, O Aisha, the horrors, the terrors, the trials, the difficulties will be so much, so much on that day that nobody will have the time to be looking or casting a single glance on anybody next to him or her. The world at that day, the statement of every human being, even every single prophet will be, yeah, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Mind self, mind self, mind self. Every single person will be worried about his own self. They wouldn't even be worried about the other person. They wouldn't be thinking about another person. Picture yourself that you are in great danger. You are probably in the midst of the ocean drowning. Water is getting into your system. You are actually seeing that. You are in the inside the house. The whole house has caught itself into a fire, blazing fire. You are burning. And somebody is naked there. Do you have the time to look and concentrate on that? <laughs> no. You want to save yourself. The trouble that you will be in will actually take you over. Take you over entirely. So the Prophet ﷺ said that the sun will come down above the heads of men. Hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari alayhi rahmah. Also by Imam Muslim. To the distance of one mile. And when the sun reaches so high, just above the heads of men on the day of judgment, it will be so hot. I mean, we can well imagine how hot it will be. Because it is so far, millions of miles away, and yet it is so hot. It is so hot. It's at times extremely difficult for people to come out of the homes or to travel. It's extremely difficult. The sun will be above the heads of men. To the distance of one mile on the day of judgment. To the extent that people will be drowning in their own perspiration. Swimming in their own perspiration. The perspiration will rise like an ocean. Everybody. To the extent that they committed sins and wrongdoings on the face of the earth. That's the amount of perspiration and sweat that each person will be in. On that day. The hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari. The day will be so difficult. It will be so harsh. It will be so severe even upon the prophets that people will begin. People will beg Allah. They will ask Allah. They will say, oh Allah, please begin the day of judgment. Let us come out from this azab. This itself is an azab. And there is where they will go to different prophets. 
they will go to one prophet after another prophet until even the prophets will direct them to go to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who will come and make shafa'atul qubra the great intercession to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will plead with Allah to begin the day of judgment and upon that Allah will commence the day of reckoning and the day of accounting with the people but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us so that we may understand the value of the good deeds we do. He says on that dreadful day, on that terrible day, on that day that people, some people, they will actually be saying, Oh Allah, if you have to throw us in the fire of hell, you make that judgment to throw us in the fire of hell. But please release us from this day. This day we can't be the Quran says that one day will last for 50,000 years of what you count in the world. The duration of one day, Allah says in the Quran, will be 50,000 of your years that you know of the world. One day. So people will do everything to get out of it. The Prophet ﷺ said, the believers, who while on the face of the earth, they used to pay particular attention to those matters that are coming in their lives. And what awaits them in the hereafter. And they did good deeds. Allah will honor them and Allah will bless them. And on that day when the sun will be so close. Above the heads of men. Subhanallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. In a hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And he told us about seven fortunate category of people. Who will not be in this trouble. Who will be away from that, that dreadful plight. That situation. The horrors. The heat. They will be subhanallah. They will be protected by Allah. They will be honored by Allah. They will be separate. They wouldn't have to go through that, those hardships. Who are those people? Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Saba'atun yudhilluhum Allahu fi dhillihi yawma la dhilla illa dhilluhu. That there are seven categories of people who Allah will bless with being under the shade of his arush on the day of judgment. When there will be no shade except his shade. So understand that. Picture that, that a massive plane. The sun is one mile above our head. Everybody is caught up in that distress. But here is it. Allah's arush comes down. Allah's arush provides shade for some people. Everybody will be rushing towards there. But everybody wouldn't be able to get entry. They wouldn't be able to get entry there. Angels will be surrounded it. Angels will be guarding it. And Allah will give even and permission for seven categories of people. Allah will order the angels that anybody who falls into any one of the seven categories of people, bring them under the shade of mine arush. And besides these seven categories, nobody will get shade under mine arush. Everybody will be out there. Everybody will suffer. Everybody will suffer the horrors of that day. Who are those, which are those seven categories? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam highlighted these to us. He said first, al-imam al-adil. He said first, a just leader. A just leader, a just leader will be honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gain shade under the arsh of Allah. Because a just leader has to go through a lot of mujahada on the face of the earth. He has to go through a lot of sacrifice. He gets a lot of bad name because we can see it for ourselves. Think about yourself. Think about situations. Anytime two people have a conflict and they have a dispute, each one of them thinks he's right. Nobody's wrong. Nobody thinks he's wrong. So when you go to somebody who is an arbitrator, who is a hakim, who is a judge, who is a leader of the community, and after hearing the case, both can't be right, he has to say somebody is wrong. So when he says somebody is wrong, then this person begins to blame him and criticize him and condemn him. This is why in the hadith recorded by Imam Abu Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ says, Man Whosoever is made in charge of the affairs of people, as a, a hakim, a governor, 
as a qadi, as a sultan, as a king of a territory or a place, or as a normal leader, someone who looks after the affairs of the people, he makes decisions and judges the matters of the people, whosoever is made in that position, then he has been slaughtered without a knife. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He has been slaughtered without a knife. Why? Because if he rules and he decides in accordance to the whims and fancies of the people, in accordance to the desires of the people, if he rules and decides matters to please people, to get recognition by the people, to win the friendship of people, to win the friendship of the family members, he rules because he's bribed to rule. He rules because such and such a person who is the wrongdoer is his friend. Then Allah will slaughter him on the day of judgment because he has ruled wrong. And if he rules according to the laws of Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are many people who are inclined and prone to wrongdoings. They wouldn't like him. They will backbite him. They will ill-speak him. They will condemn him. Because he is not ruling in their favor, so he will be slaughtered by the people that, with their tongues. So this is why being an imam or a leader who is just in accordance to the way that Allah has placed justice to occur, that person actually, he will be slaughtered. With, he's a, an imam, he's a wali, he's a governor, he's slaughtered without a knife, but because he obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will honor him with being under the shade of the arsh on the day of judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَشَابٌ نَشَعَ فِي عِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ And a youth, a young person who grows up, but in the obedience of Allah. He grows up in the worship of Allah. And that is something that has a lot of mujahada and a lot of sacrifice also. Because when a young person is growing up, a young boy or young girl, and they are passing through the different times of their youthful life, they are attracted by so many things and they are distracted by so many things. They are always inclined to certain things that will actually pull people towards them. The youths. They will pull the youths. Something is always there. It's the friendship. It's the order of the day. It is what surrounds the community. It is the sway of the day. It is the culture that holds dominance over the lives of the people. It is the many attractions coming through the media. It is the beauty. It's the glamour and the glitter. It's the music. It's the, all these things. Even when a young person is growing up, who is attentive to Allah, who wants to do that which is right, who wants to be obedient, who is conscious of salat, who is conscious of doing the wrong thing, another great trial they have to face is the pressure of those around them. Because the other youths do not want them to be like that. Because the other youths want them to be like their own selves. So people will begin to use uh, sarcastic statements. You are too pious. You are too righteous. You are too holy. You are praying too much. Be like a young man. Be like a, a, a young woman. A young person has to enjoy life. So all this pressure comes to the youth. But if that young person, that young man and young woman, they turn away from all these different things that will distract them from their real focus and their real objective in life. And they worship Allah and they turn to Allah and they are actually conscious of their deen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor them on the day of judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said also, a person whose heart is attached to the masjid. The third category. A man who loves the masjid. He loves the masjid dearly. He may not be in the masjid for the whole day or the night. And this is not a requirement. But he loves Allah's house to such an extent. The love of Allah's house is always in his heart. He is always hoping to go to the masjid. Whenever he leaves, he looks for an opportunity to come back. He loves to come in Allah's house, to sit in Allah's house. He gets that peace, that itminan, that sukun, that tranquility. And whoever, 
His heart is attached to the house of Allah that can only come when he has love for Allah and the love of the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said another category of people are two such individuals who love each other and they love each other not for any worldly purpose, not for any other reason except that they love each other for the sake of Allah. Whenever they meet each other, they meet each other only for Allah's sake. And when they separate, they separate for Allah's sake. In this world today, if a person loves you, probably he loves you for some reason. To get some benefit, to get an assistance, to get some help. If you love some person, that might be the same reason. Very rare you will find people, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq and put that in our, in our hearts. Very rare you find people loving each other only for Allah's sake. Only for Allah's sake. So when you love a person for Allah's sake, you are not bothered about his looks. You are not bothered about his social standing. You are not bothered about his financial standing. All you are bothered about is he is a Muslim. He is a believer. I am a believer. I have to love him. Regardless of where he comes from. Where he lives. What is the color of his skin? What is the texture of the hair? That does not matter to you. When you love someone, you love someone only for Allah's sake. And that is so great in the sight of Allah. That those people who love Allah who love each other for Allah's sake, then Allah will admit them under the shade of his arsh. Subhanallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also mentioned another category of people who will be under the shade of the arsh of Ar-Rahman on the day of judgment will be those people that whenever they give charity, they give sadaqah, then their charity is free from riya and sumah. It is free from showing off. And it is free from self-conceit and vanity. They give it with such sincerity that the left hand does know what the right hand has given for the sake of Allah. They give it and their concern is only that Allah alone knows that they have given for his sake. That they do not want anybody to know about it because they fear that takabbur and pride may come in their hearts. So the Prophet wasallam spoke about that. He also said another category of people. They are those people, subhanallah. They are those people who remember Allah in seclusion. Subhanallah. And they begin to think about Allah. And they begin to think about the favors and the boons of Allah. And they think about what Allah has done for them. And they remember Allah with such sincerity, deep down in their hearts, that tears begin to flow from their eyes when they begin to think about their Lord, Allah subhanahu. That, subhanallah, displays the level of ikhlas and sincerity in their heart. That comes on account of Allah's love and the deep love the individual has for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people who behave in this manner, meaning those who have that trait in them, and they remember Allah in this way, and their love in the hearts for Allah is filled with sincerity, then Allah will honor them on the day of judgment and they will find and get a place under the arsh of Allah. And the seven category of people who will gain a place away from the scorching heat of the sun and they will be under the arsh of Ar-Rahman on the day of judgment. They will be honored by Allah. Allah will elevate them. Allah will show them you know, that great honor and exaltation. It will be those people, that person. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, رَجِلٌ طَلَبَتْهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْ سِبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي خَافَ اللَّهِ A man, that a woman attracted. A man that a woman attracted. Or she tried to seduce. She tried to encourage him to her. And the woman was a beautiful woman. The woman was an attractive woman. The woman may have some status and she attracts him and he feels himself because of his nafs being pulled towards her. To look at her, to be a friend with her, to associate with her, to take her as a friend and to maintain such relationship that is deemed to be haram. So he's been attracted to this woman. His nafs is pulling him to that because shaitan uses the nafs 
to move us away from the right path. But when all those things are happening, he tells himself, Inni akhaf Allah. No, I can't do that. I fear Allah. I fear Allah. That is a very, very great trait and quality in a believer. That any time a man is attracted to something wrong and haram, he stops right there and he says, I fear Allah. I fear the punishment of Allah. I fear the hereafter. I fear the day of judgment. I fear to be thrown in the fire of hell. I am not going to give in to any wrongdoing. Those people will be fortunate to get a place under the arsh of Allah on the day of judgment. So my dear respected and beloved brothers and my dear sisters, in this tradition, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam highlighted to us the seven categories of people who will be fortunate on the day of judgment to gain some shade, cool, calm, not hot, not in the scorching heat of the sun that is one mile above the heads of men, but they will be honored to gain shade from the arsh of Allah. I'm sure that each and every one of us here will like to be somewhere under the shade of that arsh of Allah. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Yawma la dhilla illa dhilluhu. On that day, there will be no shade except that shade. Nobody will be thrown, uh, thrown in Jahannam as yet. Nobody will go to paradise. The accounting is going to start. It's an open place. Only one shade you will have there is the shade of the arsh of Allah. Who will go there? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned. So you know what that tells us? If we don't want to be burning in that hot sun, in the scorching heat, then it means we will have to find some place under the arsh of Allah. That's the only way out. In other words, if we hear about Jahannam and nobody wants to go to Jahannam, where do you think you will want to go? Jannat. So if you want to go Jannat, you will have to do, we will have to do the things to go to Jannat. So if we don't want to be under that sun that is one mile above the heads of men, burning, being scorched in the heat, swimming in the perspiration, drowning in the perspiration, there is only one way we can be out of that is to find some place under the arush of Allah. As for who will be there? Allahu Akbar. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was extremely compassionate to mankind that he identified the seven categories so that we must try to belong to one of these categories. If we can find ourselves in the seven categories, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Nurun ala nur, light upon light. But if we can find ourselves belonging to one category, at least we can fall under the, in that shade. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with shade under his arush on the day of judgment. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the divine aid and the assistance, the strength and the ability and the tawfiq to do good deeds and try to belong from among these categories who will be honored by him on the day of judgment and will get some shade under his arush. وَالْآخِرَ الدَّوَانَ عَنْ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الايمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القران ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الايمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القران سائر في طريق الحق يا جند الله